Our second scripture reading comes from John 1, verses 21 to 42. The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is, who, this is he of whom I said. After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came, bap but I came baptizing with water for this reason that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not, did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and, ri and, rem Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again with, was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following him, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated, which translated mean, meaning teacher, Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon, and Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of Peter. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated to Peter. Thanks, Molly. So as we begin this new year, we had a covenant celebration um, last week with Jesus' baptism to root ourselves in who we are um, and who we are called to be as Christians whose names have been written into Christ's name in the waters of our own baptisms. And so we're going to do some 101 um, and, and looking into the scriptures and what it means to be a Christian and what it means to be a disciple and what it means to follow. And um, there are, as we follow Christ, um, working through, right, because that was his first moment um, in stepping in in his baptism into public ministry and claiming that call um, in his life and his ministry. Um, and so we're going to follow that um, as we try to figure that out for what that means for us individually and collectively here at Epworth and Cockeysville in 2017, a few years after Christ did that, but you know, it's needed now just as then. And so we are here together and we come to these scriptures um, from Isaiah as we look at what it means to be called. And it's an incredible process, right? And Barry, could you put that um, scripture back up? I didn't warn you ahead of time. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Um, but yes. And so we have, um, as we go back, there's, this is a servant song. And we all know the first servant song that was God saying what God was about to do. And the servant that God would bring and the peace that that servant would bring, right? The one where he says even a bruised reed he won't break because of the care and the tenderness. Well, this is the servant speaking um, this time. And if we could go back to the Isaiah passage, um, and we're going to go through the summons. That was a really quick call, right? As we, as we follow when, and what happens when God calls us. But we have this wonderful moment, right, of knowing who we are and knowing our purpose and what we were made for. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, God named me. That's beautiful and powerful and a little bit intimidating <laughs> because that's a lot to be able to live into once we hit life and all of its chaos and complications. But not only were we knit together, we hear that psalm, right, being echoed, knit together in our mother's womb. Um, we've been shaped and we've been tripped 
equipped and trained um, and to what we need to be. So whether that's a prophetic word and our mouth is like a sharp sword, um, but in the shadow hid, right? Until that time when we are need needed or put and polished and we're ready, but we're put into the quiver until the timing is exactly right and we are who God needs in that place and at that time to work through us. And there is God, right? We hear this baptismal echoing. You are my servant. You are my son, my beloved, with whom, you, I, you, with whom I am well pleased, in whom I will be glorified. So all of this work and all of this relationship and all of this wonderfulness, and then life hits, right? And poor Jesus is going to be thrown out to the desert, right, to be a wilderness, to be tempted for 40 days. Yay, I've been baptized. There's no other greater reception than that, right, than not eating or being able to do anything. And, and here is this servant. So we're all there. We're right. The Lord has called me before I was born, and now all of a sudden I have labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward is with God, but I failed. <laughs> like it hasn't worked and, and I'm exhausted and I'm burnt out and I'm done. We can't identify with that at all, right? <laughs> like we've never experienced those moments. And then the Lord speaks again. And again, there's a reminding of who we are and how we were formed in the womb and who we were formed to be. And that honor to be held in that sight, to be known, and that reaching, that reaching for strength that is beyond our own. Because I very much believe that God gives us more than we can handle. Have you checked? I mean, did we just listen to what we raised in joys and concerns today? Like, there's too much for us alone. But if God is our strength, and it is God's strength working through us, then we have a fighting chance. And then God does what always happens. We just make it through. We're just getting resettled. We're finding our call again. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. Yeah, that original call was amazing, but it's too light a thing. And now that you've been through fire, and now that you've deepened, and now that you've opened yourself even further up to me, now no good deed goes unpunished, and we can do more. Are you ready? <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm sorry, guys. I don't have good news on this one for what it means to be called until Jesus returns for good. Um, because it means that the more that we accomplish, the more that grounded we are and the deeper we come, that means that the storms won't rock our boats as badly as they did before, which will be good. But it also means we'll be able to take on greater and greater storms. And the storms are present, and the storms are real in, in our own personal lives and in our collective lives, and we see them and we know them. And so it doesn't seem like a great reward of like, yay, now I get to take on more. What about, what about that moment I was just crying out and burnt out and tired and exhausted and feeling like I had failed? This is very much a process. When we sing in the summons, where we, will we go where we don't know and never be the same? That's for real. But if we want to truly be the Methodists that make disciples for the transformation of the world, this is how that happens. And too often, we get stuck and we're excited and we're there and, you know, church world, right? We've done our visioning process. We know exactly what our purpose is and who we are and we're going to go do that. And then we hit all of life's complication and all of the derailings and all of the things that don't work and all of the fails and we're done. We're exhausted and it didn't work and we're demoralized. And often churches don't recover from that space and they stay there. And they've tried it, it didn't work, so we're done. But that's the exact moment God can do more than we ever expected. If we're able to stay open, if we're able to cry out, 
And if we're able to put ourselves in a place where we're ready to accept God's strength to work through us, and we're ready to try again. It means that we have to flip our understanding of failure. And instead of being it something that we're ashamed of, we've got to make it something we're proud of. Because it means we're active, and it means we're doing something, and it means we're doing something beyond our own capability. And that we are practicing relying on God, and that we know that it's not always going to work out. But it means we're alive. It means we're taking our call seriously, and it means we are in a place where God can use us and come back and say, yeah, that call I had for you at first, too light a thing. I've got something else. And it's not easy. And we're going to skip ahead to the gospel according to John because I think John testifies and witnesses for us in this scripture the thing that is hardest of all for us to do. To be a disciple in which this discipleship and the goal and God's kingdom work is more important than our call in it. So that when the next faithful step comes along and it requires another leader, we are able to point beyond ourselves. John was a leader. He was preparing the way. He went through locusts and wild honey and wilderness and people coming after him and we know how his story ended too but he was able to work himself out of a job and when jesus showed up on the scene to take his followers and be like yeah if you if i did my job that means you're not i'm not ever going to see you again you're not ever going to be following me again you're going to be following the lamb of god he was able to pass off that mantle in a way that empowered the movement and empowered the growth of the leaders that he was training so that more could be done for more people. That is not easy to do, friends. But that is where transformation happens. And as we are standing in a very um, sacred moment in our history this week and honoring all of those who have given themselves in a very real way in a very particular time of our history in God's covenant of justice and righteousness and loving kindness to make a way for God's justice and joy, I want to look at the discipleship journey that they were on um, and look at that because You know, it didn't all just happen when Rosa sat down one day and refused to give up her seat. It wasn't that she was tired and just didn't want to move anymore. I want to start with Joanne Robinson's story because I find Isaiah in her. She was the first one of her family to get a college education. She found that calling and who she was created to be, and she went for it and she fought for it and she got a teaching position for English as a professor at Alabama State University and she had that call and she was living it out in a very very difficult time and then in 1949 she hopped a bus in Montgomery to go home for Christmas vacation you know that hard-earned rest for all the fighting and the work that she had done and for that call that she was giving everything to There were two other people on the bus that day, um, both African-American, and she happened to sit in the whites-only section when there were no whites on the bus. And she didn't even realize it at first and then found that the bus driver had pulled the bus over and come and started yelling at her. And she was so scared that he would physically hurt her, she got off the bus. She did get to Christmas vacation, didn't say anything about it to her family because she was so shaken and so ashamed and so confused, but came back to Montgomery and for the first time went to the Women's Political Council and told her story. And they just looked at her like, what? (laughs) And it was unremarkable to them. It was commonplace. That was the experience. That was in 1949. That was six years years before Rosa Parks sat down. 
And in those six years, Joanne made it her mission. She found an attorney who was sympathetic, Fred Gray, to challenge the system. She had meeting after stonewalled meeting after meeting with the mayor and his staff to try to find a way forward. And with all of those shut down failure moments, she finally came to see that the only way, since they had no access to the vote for real um, at that point, was a boycott that that was the only way the system would break enough that they would be able to move their agenda forward. She and two students, the night that Rosa was arrested, mimeographed 52,500 leaflets to get distributed. And yes, that was an amazing thing in one night and one response, I know, right? That was a long night and a lot of work, Stephanie. But the plans and the maps and the organization for how people would get to where they needed to be or how the information would get out or how this would even work, those were laid years in advance of that night. But because of what Joanne did, because when she hit failure that she did not give up, you know, that call, all she wanted to do was change the racial injustice in the bus system in Montgomery, Alabama. But God said that's too light a thing. And through her, God began a movement that changed all of us. And when we look at John the Baptist pointing out beyond us, there's E.D. Nixon in Montgomery as well, who is a porter um, for the trains and helped had helped organize unions there incidentally was a friend of Eleanor Roosevelt because he had wrote requesting a USO service club for the African-American um, servicemen um, in Montgomery and she had taken action on it and he met her personally in a train where he was porter right and so he had he had that connection um, he had helped organize through the Montgomery Voters League a 700 person march and working for voting rights in the area he was the NAACP state um, head president and he was 1954 Alabama Journal's Man of the Year for all of the work that he had done. But yet in 1955, when Rosa Parks was arrested, he was the one who convinced her that she was the one, that this was the moment that they had been waiting for, that this is what was needed. But as we would expect him to take the leadership and the helm and organize it, no, he went to this newbie over at Dexter Avenue you know, at church. Sorry, I almost said United Methodist. Sorry. It's just me and my, um, and whenever there's a church, it has to be United Methodist, right? That's all I say every day. Um, but he went over to the newbie over at Dexter Avenue and was like, hey, you're new in town. You have the least amount of enemies out of all any of us. We need you to lead this. And that's how Martin Luther King Jr. got started in the Montgomery Improvement Association. Because E.D. Nixon passed the baton. Because he knew that the movement and the purpose and the call was more important than he was. Rosa herself had spent 12 years in the NAACP, seven of them as the state secretary. And that's not taking minutes of the meeting. That's going around traveling when we know how dangerous that is, right? Finding those who had experienced injustices and documenting them in order to build legal cases. It was incredibly risky and dangerous. The summer before, she had been in Tennessee um, at a two-week workshop living in an intentionally integrated community for two weeks with 47 others as they did a workshop on racial desegregation and how to implement the Supreme Court's decision. And at the end of that time, they had to give a case study on how they were going to take it back to their own communities and what they were going to do and what they were going to lead. And she was like, yeah, I'm from Montgomery. It's the bedrock of the Confederacy. Nothing's going to ever begin there. So I'm going to commit to working with the NAACP youth leadership so that when something changes, they'll be ready to be a part of that. But God says, too light a thing. And where does this movement begin? And where does it spread to affect all of us and bring about a transformation? In that very place. I want more than anything to be a Methodist and to be a disciple that does, in fact, bring about real transformation 
in our city here in Cockeysville, and should God say too light a thing, in our world. But the only way that we are going to be able to do that is if we help one another develop the grit and the perseverance and the gospel resiliency that such a journey demands of us. If you are willing, I am willing to walk this road, and I'd like to see what God could bring about. Amen.